officially started. So, uh, who, who's going first? Uh, we're staring at your wallpaper. I know. Oh. Well, we need Danny. someone to kick this off. Oh, I'm eating, so I'll just watch. I'm, I'm sick. Well, so we have, we have 50 questions, and they're uh, basically like open ended interview questions. Almost like a tech I'll interview. go first. Eric, you down? Yeah. All right. Question number one. Name the seven OSI model layers. You want it from top to bottom, or? Either one. Um, the layer one is the physical layer. Physical. The layer two is the data link. Data link. The layer three is um, the network layer. Layer four is the transport layer. Layer five is the session layer. Eleven sets is the presentation layer, and eleven seven is the application layer. So can right. we explain each one? I mean, we can if you want to throw it down. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I kind of know this one by heart. I mean. Okay, here we go. Uh, we'll, yeah. su we'll supplement that. I'll throw a few extra questions at you. Uh, oh, yeah, cool. Which layer will I find a frame? I'm sorry, what? In which layer will I find a frame? Oh, um, that's the layer two. Layer two, very good. That's the layer two PDU, right? What's the, what's yep. the layer three PDU? IP. Pet. Packet, yeah, there you go. So okay. make sure if you see those words in CompTIA questions, they're real specific about it. Like, frame means we're talking about layer two. Very nice. Right. Uh, all right, last question about this. In which layer... The frame means packet? Will you find... Or which layer is responsible for compression and encryption? Um, that would be the presentation layer. There you go. There you go. Uh -huh. Very good. Eric's Eric's testing soon, right? You said Eric. Yep. Yeah, tomorrow. We got this. All right, Eric. Choose our choose our next volunteer. It's up to you. What me? Um, oh, never mind. I choose him. I choose Eric. Eric. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. I'll probably get whatever it is wrong. Sure. And, well, and realistically, like I don't care if you guys get all these wrong. My, my goal <laughs> is, by the end of these fifty questions, you might have a list of bullet point notes, right? Like you, you didn't know ten of them or twenty or forty of them. Who cares? As long as you okay. get a solid list of notes out of it, you know that's the point. Right. Yeah. Let's do it. All right, Ari. What is the standard difference between POP and IMAP protocols? Uh, what was the second word of that? Uh, so what is the standard difference between POP and IMAP protocols? A POP downloads emails to the client and deletes them from the server. Whereas IMAP... Leaves them on the server. Yeah, so POP does not save a copy on a server by standard, by default, right? IMAP does. That's a very, very uh, big bullet point. And of course, if you ever have like a troubleshooting question where a user opens their email on a laptop and can't access it on their desktop, what do you think the answer is? You're using POP. Yeah, you're using POP or using an unsecure version of POP or, or saving, a, realistically in POP, you, you can enable saving a copy of the server, but by default, it does not. Very good. And that, what, is, uh, what, is, what, are the, what are the ports for POP in my map? Um, I forget. <laughs> ah! Oh, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I prepare for this. Alright, alright, alright. Anybody help them out? What are the ports for Papa Rabbit? 110 and 143. What was that? There you go. Yeah. Pop is 110, IMAP is 143. Very good. 993 and 995. Uh, so those secure. are secure, yeah, or, or like pop over SSL would be uh, 993, or sorry, 995. IMAP over SSL is 995. 993. Yep. Very good. All right, Ari, who's going next? Hey, Electro. I'll go next. What was that? Was that? Electro. Electro? Okay, Electro. Electro, you got this one, and then um, Wholesome, you can go after that, right? Okay. Uh, Electra, are you with us? Oh, uh, you said I'm ready. You got, you got your mic on? He said yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Very good. 
All right, what does TCP and UDP stand for, and what are the basic definitions of each? Let me get this one. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, to which is basically going to be able uh, to distribute segments re 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 reliable transmissions, if you will, with no errors. Whereas UDP is basically going to be a connectionless delivery, which is also a user datagram protocol. Yeah, look at that. Man, chat GPT couldn't have done better. Solid, <laughs> solid. And I, I'm really glad you brought up the bullet point or that word connectionless, because it's kind of weird, right? So the test will call UDP connectionless and TCP connection oriented. All right, follow up question, Electro. TCP has a three way handshake. What, what is Syn that? Synac ACK. There you go. So that synchronize, synchronize acknowledge, and acknowledge. S-Y-N and A-C-K. So if you see sign, sign, act, act, that's like a really obnoxious way just to say TCP. Very good, very good. All right, Wholesome, you up next? Got it. All right, here we go. Is port 23 secure? Why and why not? Why, why, why? Port 23? Yep. Port 23 is a telnet. It is not secure. Why is it not secure? Um, You're right. I don't know the reason why. Anybody want to help them out? There's no encryption. Very good. No encryption. And, That's my question. Oh. You can ask me one. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and that's a good point. I mean, even easy questions are hard to answer open-ended on the spot, right? But yeah, that, oh yeah, that telnet, like by definition, it's text-based, plain text. Yeah, plain text, not encrypted. I would actually argue that those those questions you're not ready for that you just answer out of the blue are harder than the ones you prepare for. Oh yeah. I think, so. I think that counts as me answering two questions almost, wouldn't you say? I mean, it does. We got plenty more, though. Nice. <laughs> All right, I'll take the points. Hey, is this, uh, is this method helping us? Did, are we starting to pick up a little bit of bullet points mm -hmm. here? So far, uh, so good, yeah. Ask yeah. Coach. Yep. Mm -hmm. Coach. All right, hey, Holson, who's next? Uh, I'll send Kiwi. Kiwi? Kiwi. Kiwi minted? Yeah. Yeah, what's up, everybody? What's up? All right, you ready for your interview <laughs> question? Let's go. Yes. All right, what is the APIPA address, and what causes the creation of an APIPA address? Um, an APIPA address is an IP address that's assigned when the DHCP server is unavailable. Very good. And it means you essentially cannot connect to the network. Nice. Um, actual address is um, 169, I think. 169 in the first? Or something. Yeah, very good. 169254, you got to know that. Um, I mean, that'll pop up in the most random places, and they definitely expect you to uh, notice, hey, that, that's, that's an APIPA address, and DHCP was jacked up in some way, right? <laughs> Nice. What, what do you mean we're distracting you, Swoop? I'm just teasing. Oh. I was I was posting presidential pictures five minutes ago, and then they're posting that. Oh. All right. Nice job, Kiwi. Who's next? Pick our next volunteer. <laughs> um, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Where's Jeffrey at? That's coach. Oh, here we go. Okay. Microphone charging. All right. This might be a long one. Uh -huh. What's the difference between a pin, Fizz. LAN, and Fizz. LAN? All right. Pass it off to Fizz. We'll, we'll get Jeffrey a short one. Fizz, are you there? 
You didn't speak in English. And, oh, never mind. Oh, uh, the Jeffrey answered. <clears throat> so, Jeffrey said pan personal, land local, WAN wide. I agree with that. But what are the differences? Like, you wouldn't just say that in an interview, right? Anybody want to want to pick this one up? Because I got a lot of follow-up questions. I would think pan is you're more using like Wi-Fi, so like mm. you know you got maybe like Bluetooth headphones, like a smartwatch, like you know devices Ooh. say maybe like on your kind of body. So, like all your devices connected directly to each other. Yeah, but would Wi-Fi be placed in a pan? No, no, I'd say lab. anything Bluetooth. Oh, and that's a good observation because the test is going to try to burn you into picking like a Wi-Fi 8211 for a personal area network. So, supplemental question. There's three specific technologies found in a pan. And we hit this in A plus and in our Net Plus class. Bluetooth is one of them. What are the other two? Like Zigbee or Yeah. Well, so would Zigbee or Z-Wave be NFC is one of them? I was going to ask that. I was going to ask, is Zigbee technically uh, pan or land? Because it it's a bunch of smart devices connecting each other to yeah. all share a Wi-Fi network. Exactly. So I would argue it's land. I would argue it's land. I agree with that. Yeah, Zigbee and Z-Wave, those two uh, wireless technologies for IoT devices... I mean, when you have a network of devices, that's going to be a local area network or larger, right? Mm -hmm. So in the chat, R is NFC, that near field communication, and infrared. Yeah. yeah. Very good. In the LAN, specifically, you're going to see 802.11 and 802.3, right? Your Ethernet and wireless standards kind of rule in the LAN. So for those of you that have taken CompTIA tests, you know the wording can be... Uh, a pain in the ass, right? <laughs> I think the difference is like a, a legitimate inter internet connection, right? So like a LAN, you'd have an internet connection, you know, you'd have the separation between WAN and LAN, but PAN is like either one-to-one -one or a bunch of devices connected to each other, but not the internet. But it, I would use that to differentiate. And that PAN is going to be specific to a single user, right? It's like Bluetooth okay. headphones, for example. One specific right. user. Very good. Nice. It could be a little ambiguous if you have like a Bluetooth hotspot to do networking. A Bluetooth <laughs> hotspot? <laughs> yeah. Mm. No, so rewind, let's dissect that statement a little bit. So, like a hotspot converts one type of data to an 8211 broadcast, right? Yeah. So, that would always be a LAN. If it's broadcasting into a web, right? Yeah. Tricky, man. See, the, the verbiage is kind of savage in the corners. Hey, good breakdown, though. Good breakdown. Who's next? Uh, hey, Jeffrey, who's next? Pick our volunteer. What about that girl, Danny K3, that hasn't talked the whole time? It doesn't matter who's gone. Danny's going to go at least three times today, so... <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Wait, she, what? She thinks she's gonna get away with sitting there all lowercase. Look at her. I'm, I'm eating. <laughs> but, yeah. Sure. Why don't you throw an uppercase letter in there? Or I can't. I can't I'll promise volunteer. anything. But no, I'll no, volunteer. That's fine. Oh, no, 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 no. I'll take that one. Not Let me take this he, one. He's a savage, not no. you. Where, where did this one? Take uh, a seat. Taz Tech is up next. Taz, you ready for your question? Mm, there we go. You eat so slowly. Oh, Taz, Taz is a uh, dual wheel and babysitting right now. All right, who, who volunteered to take it? Coach. Coach, all right, let's go. Coach, what is a hypervisor? Explain type one and two, please. Oh, uh, a hypervisor is used for, uh, uh, what's it called, like virtual machines? It, right? is, it is used for virtual machines, yeah. Okay, and type one is more like based on hardware, bare metal. Type two is, it operates on a pre-existing OS. Ooh-wee. Okay, Ooh. thanks, I agree with that. <laughs> okay. so, so, I agree. So a hypervisor is the software that manages virtual machines, right? 
So whenever you see that term hypervisor, that's the software that opens and runs and manages a virtual machine. Type one, like he, uh, he said, based on hardware, bare bones. Uh, type one means that like you're building a server, right? But instead of like when you build the hardware, you're not loading an operating system on it. You're just loading a, a hypervisor. So right, right from the actual firmware software, the UEFI, you're throwing on a hypervisor. So type one has no operating system. Type two is like me running uh, VMware inside of my Windows 11 PC. Yeah, ESXi is a good example of a type one. So type two means you're loading a hypervisor inside of your operating system. Type one means pretty much it's a server and the first software you're loading on that server is the hypervisor. Now, which one would they expect us to know like the most for the like net plus? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of basic type two hypervisor questions, yeah. but also type one, because <laughs> net plus is going to bring up that VDI, VDE term, the virtual okay. desktop infrastructure and virtual desktop environment. And it, anytime you have a huge mass of operating systems that are virtualized going back to a server, that hypervisor on that server is always going to be a type one. Did that help solidify some things, or did I just confuse the hell out of everybody? No, that's great. Mm, works for me. Thank you. Solid, mm -hmm. solid. Can we talk about Proxmox? Right now? No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Anyway. I've been working a lot with it, and you mentioned DSXI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the rules change a little bit in the real world, okay? I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I think uh, ESXi is more popular in industries, right? Uh, in my experience, yes, but yeah, I, I can't I can't say everywhere because some of you will go to work and never see it and still have a huge amount of VMs. Mm. Uh, let's see, someone asked a question in the chat. Um, yeah, that's me. Yeah, so w when you load a, a virtual machine into a hypervisor, it's going to utilize a virtual NIC. It's not like you have to install another software for it to use a virtual network interface card. Gotcha. Now, if you wanted it to use virtual switches or something like that, you would have to go manually uh, specify that. All right. Has anybody used ESXi before? It's, I mean, the interface is real easy. It's like yeah, I've used super easy. Use what? Uh, Say that again? I, ESXi. Oh, okay. I used it once, and I, I saw it, and I was just, like, blown away by it, and there was just a lot there, and I was like, I'm going to need to take a step back and come back to this another day. Yeah, I mean, realistically, like, if you go to work and they want you to work with, like, uh, like, like a Type 1 hypervisor, a lot of the times they a really simple interface, like creating oh, yeah. virtual machines, managing the hardware, you know, setting limits for, like, resource usage, and that's kind of the gist of it. I mean, your company don't have its own naming conventions, but it's literally like three panels in the software. It's, it's nothing crazy and NASA advanced or anything. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you go to work and they want you to mess with virtual machines in like a server-based hypervisor, it's, it's really straightforward. That's why I always tell people, you know, when they start playing with VMs, I say, you know, go and use ESXi or Proxmox because it's like, yeah, you get the VMs and it's like, once you learn that, it's so much more convenient to spin up VMs and learn. Yeah, like that's so much more in depth. I remember um, the first time I awesome. used the Type One, like in a, in an environment, I was kind of like, I expected it to be a lot more complicated than this. <laughs> but if you know yeah. how a virtual machine works, that's that's it. Yeah, it's a uh, it, it's it's a short learning curve, but uh, there's definitely a lot to it. I mean, if you understand how VMs work, though, and once you understand yeah. that, the rest is cake. Mm-hmm. Cool. Next volunteer, Danny. Thank you for volunteering. Yeah. That's not being volunteered. Are you ready? It's uh, being volatile, but okay. Danny, in what order? Oh, my God. In order, what are the correct colors for a T568 Bravo standard? Okay, give me a second. Let me think. All right, all right. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, my God. Need the Jeopardy music. Gotta get to Google, they get to images no then... no no i'm not trying to do that wait give me the first yeah. and i'll do the rest now we can do this the easy way oh. or we can do it the hard way <laughs> <laughs> wait give me the first color let me think 
It's uh, not. It's not green. Okay, so it's orange. There you go. Okay, so orange, white, orange, then green, white, blue, mm -hmm. blue, white, green. Yep. Brown, white, brown. I think. There you go. Okay. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. Now I can't breathe. Okay. Well, and honestly, so you're right, but in my caveman brain, I don't even consider the white stripes. Like, for alpha, green, green, orange, blue, blue, orange, brown, brown, and every odd pin is striped. Same thing, mm -hmm. with, same thing with Bravo. Orange, orange, green, blue, blue, green, brown, brown, all odd pins are striped. So okay. if that helps you memorize it easier, you don't have to worry about the slash white. You know okay. I mean? And someone, mm -hmm. someone did put in the chat a good note, too. Uh, going from Alpha to Bravo pins one and three and two and six switch. So ultimately orange and green. Right? Okay. Yeah. There's hey, another great. way that I'm able to memorize it. I think this should be worth like three questions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh. No. <laughs> All right, Danny, who's next? Um. Let me see. I'll see you. Jared. Jared. Stay red. Yeah, I figured. That's yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was coming? Mm hmm All right. Next question. What is the function of a crimper, punch down, toner probe, or TDR or OTDR? Let's four, go. Four questions in one. Let's go. All right. So the crimper is going to be what uh, straps the RJ45 onto the uh, that caper. Yep. Um, the punch down tool, I believe, is like what actually like wires the RJ45, if I'm correct. Um, and then the toner probe slash foxhound um, is what the <coughs> cable tracing. So yeah, so a toner probe or fox and hound that traces and locates cables, right? There you yep. go. Um, so the punch down tool. Let's go back a little bit to that. Do you use this when using an RJ forty five? Um, is it for straight wires? <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. The punch down to my favorite, that? my favorite instructor, Google Images. <laughs> All right, so a punch down tool. Come on, there we go. There's a good picture. It's kind of like a sharp screwdriver, but you use this to connect an Ethernet cable to like a patch panel or a 110 block, or even like a, if you see an, like an Ethernet port that's built into the wall, like the back of the Ethernet port will look like this. To where you're, you're just taking those eight colors and you're punching it directly into a color-coded slot. Um, so the test is going to try to trick you into choosing a punch-down tool for like creating a cat cable. And don't fall for that bait. So a punch-down sure. tool goes into a, uh, like a 110 block or a patch panel or the back of a wall jack when you don't need an RJ45 actual end cap. And finally... What is a TDR or OTDR's job? Oh, I'm not quite sure. Right. That's to find breaks, right? In the uh, domain fiber. reflectometer, optical time domain reflectometer. Yeah, so time domain reflectometer and optical time domain reflectometer. And I don't also, remember uh, seeing these. So right. that OTDR, that, that, that's just a tool that tells you where a break in a fiber cable is. Uh, is always, there any other name for that? I mean, the, the long name. The optical no, time but... domain reflectometer. Oh. Yeah, the, the O is for fiber. TDR is the same thing with coax. I don't think you're going to see that on the exam. But I've used one exactly one time. Exactly one time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's it's going to be a really useful tool if you've got like 400 meter fiber cable stretches, you know? So when you see this OTDR, which will definitely be on net plus, it finds a break in fiber cable. So it tells you how far away. Very good, very good. You want to look up an image of o o OTDR? Very well. <laughs> so, so demanding. Oh, uh, here's one. Uh, oh, that's cool. So you plug it in and it says, uh, your crap's broken. It gives you, in some way, shape, or form, a, a distance. It tells you how far away it's broken. Hmm. So if you're finding yourself working with a lot of fiber, you probably have one of these really expensive devices. Very nice. 
Are we? Uh, how, how's our pace? Are we going too fast? I mean, uh, no. Good. Pretty good. Yeah. good. Let's go. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. We're cranking. Say, we're cranking it out. I, I hope it's. Uh, hope we're getting some good notes. Can I nominate uh, Fizz for the next question? You nominate who? Uh, Fizz. Fizz, you're back. Fizz. You're, you're back on the podium. No speaking. No, <laughs> je parle français. I can't translate. No, but I think this. He speaks perfect English. Pizza is getting a point into there because we're English. Awesome. <laughs> Let's go, Fizz. See you. All right. What type of cable is a 1000 base T, base LX, or base 5? He said, "Let's go, big boy." <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Anybody? All right, help, help him out, help him out. Well, what's a, well, ultimately, when you see this base and then something. Can I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, hit it up. Okay, I'm going to read it. What kind of, what kind of, 1000 HT. That is a Cat E and Cat 5E, Cat 6. Yep. So, and, and so the first number tells you you're transferring, right? Base T tells you it's a Cat cable. Ethernet cable. What about Base LX? Base Fiber. L yeah, when you see Base LX, SW, SX, those weird combinations of letters after that, that's not a T, that tells you transfer rate, fiber. And then after the base, if you see a number like five or 10, that's a coax cable. But I just checked and I don't think that's on the net plus objective anymore. But base five or 10 is a coax cable. Enough with the duck. I know, right? <laughs> I didn't know you guys had access to the soundboard. That's dangerous. <laughs> Wait, I have a question. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? So earlier, someone said bits are at layer one and frames are at layer two and then packets are at layer three. Oh, for the PDU? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Layer one will be bits, layer two, frames, yep. and layer three, packets. Okay. And then and layer, layer four. four Segment in layer five is data. No, so layer four is if it's TCP, it's a segment. If it's UDP, it's a datagram. Got. Okay. Then the layers five, six, and seven have they have a PDU, but it's just data because that's the application layers. So the PDU for five, six, and seven is just referred to as data. <laughs> Good question. All right, who's up next? Swooping Bird just volunteered. All right, Swooping Bird. What does the term punch down block mean? What is it? What is it user? Was it used for? Oh, that's where the uh, that's where the cables are cut off at the uh, in the um, what's it called the closet? Um, like if you're setting up in an office and you need the cables to. Uh, like the opposite of where an RJ45 would uh, plug into. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I agree. The term, the terminate. That's the word I'm looking for. That's where they terminate. Okay, yeah. They, so, they terminate <laughs> into a block instead of plugging into an actual PC or something. <laughs> or a so, switch. Yeah, so if you have like 50 computers and they're all being wired to a central like IDF or wiring, wiring closet, right? Or even a DMARC, any, any network device, you're not going to have, sometimes, you're not going to have like this whole switches with RG45 ports. But with larger like racks or networking racks, those punch down blocks will have basically just patch panels where you, that the Ethernet cable gets punched down right into the, the patch panel itself, right? Mm -hmm. Do I have any questions on this? 
Yeah, why don't we just use Ethernet cables and call it? Like, why do we have to punch them in there, old-fashioned style? Uh, it depends on the network devices, right? Is it so like, like move them around, to, right? Is it to keep them more secure and to uh, create more space for more connections? Uh, it can be, but I mean, it really just depends on what hardware you're using, right? How, how the actual IDF is built. So, looking at some of these examples, here's a, here's some some patches that have specific ports, mm -hmm. but on the back of that, they might have the actual punch down colors in the back. Whereas yeah. old school patches like this, a little bit older, but it wouldn't surprise me if these are still floating around. Yeah, I don't like that. Patches. So sorry, is that is that more common? Because everything I've seen, it usually goes into like a jack, and then you clip that jack onto like the uh, the, the patch panel. Yeah, for for newer ones, yeah, like something like this. But the the old school kind, you know, is, is not completely dead and gone. Like the new one, I understand, but I don't understand why you can't have the RJ45 connectors. You know, that just makes more sense to me. Yeah, it would be easier. I agree. Yeah. But where's the uh -oh. point of that? I'm just, you know. All right, let's get to the hard questions. Question twelve. Who wants it? That was the hard one. Danny. Yeah. Um. Can you read it? <laughs> I'm well, not close to my computer right now, sorry. Oh no, Vi Viral hasn't gone yet. Yeah. Alright, let's go. <laughs> what is a dual stack router? I believe it can handle IPv6 and IPv4. Yeah, so... Give him the easy one. Go. Pardon? You're giving Viral the easy questions. Don't say well, that old. Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, yeah. So when you see dual stack, that means that router can handle IPv4 and IPv6, right? Follow up question. IPv6 offers how many IP addresses? A lot. Uh, two to the power of 128. Yeah, a lot, right? Exponentially more. <laughs> uh, I think it's specifically 340 undecillion, if I remember correctly. But a huge amount compared to IPv4, right? So you mm -hmm. might you might get questions that just want you to notice that IPv6 offers virtually unlimited IP addresses. Gotcha. All right. And uh, Wolf can go next. Wolf can go next. Easy. Yeah, all right. What do we got? <laughs> all right. How many usable IP addresses do do I do do I have to use in the network? One ninety two one sixty eight one five slash twenty six. Uh, give me a second. What a type is in here? Do I have to? A use? Jeopardy music. Six I hate four. submitting. Uh, 62, sorry. 62, right? On a slash 26, the block size is 64. And if you guys have watched uh, the Net Plus uh, submitting video, our first class, in the, in the fourth octet, if you find the block size, you can subtract mm -hmm. two, and that's the least most. So slash 25 <laughs> would be 126. Slash 26, 62. And so Pretty easy, right? No. <laughs> no? Easy peasy. Oh, who wants the next question? Uh, Wolf, you answered that. Who gets the next question? Oh, uh, uh, I haven't heard from Ak Axicold? 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 Axicold. We doing this on Discord. <laughs> We're using names. <laughs> Axicold, you there? Yeah, I'm just in the corner listening in and spectating. <laughs> you, you want to take a swing at this? Oh, dude, you got this. Yeah, go ahead. It doesn't matter, right or wrong? It's cheese day, it it. <laughs> All right, what is the range for a public class B IPv4 address? Mm, play the crickets. Crickets? <laughs> 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 Phone a friend? 128 to 191. 128 to right. 191 yeah. in the first octet, except right. for 172.16 to 31, right? So uh, notice that that, that private yeah. class B address oh. is right in the middle of that. 
So 128 to 191 in the second or the first octet, except for that private class B range. Okay. So 128 to 191. Very good. All right, Axel Cold, who's next? Hmm. I'll go next. Wait, who said that? Um, I get to pick. Wait, wait. Uh, Nixia. <laughs> He's like, I get to pick. <laughs> Nixia, you're up, you're up on the podium. Radio check. Yeah. There you go. All right. I'm also in the corner, but oh, I know this one. What is the IPv6 loopback address? It's the two, uh, two colon one. Very good, colon colon one. Um, yeah. So keep in mind, by the way, that even though it's truncated or shortened, that colon colon one is still 128 bits. So yeah. don't, don't take the bait on the exam when they try to get you to pick one bit for that. It's still, you know. So it's basically all zeros before the one, right? Yes, exactly, very good. See, you're all worried about answering that, then you, then you nailed it. That, isn't that core one? I mean, uh, <laughs> still A+. <plus. laughs> I mean, yeah. It'll be a net plus, and you'll see it in a lot of other tests. Yeah. Still net plus, so free points, right? Yeah. I tried, to, I tried to type in colon colon one into the chat, and it just gave you that emoji. So <laughs> that, 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 that works. All right, who's up next? I'll pick... Fam, because he's also A plus with me. So. Hey, yo, fam, you ready? Yeah. Oh, you got an ad. ad. Oh, an ad. Apparently, uh, all right. Let's skip the ad. All right. In <laughs> basic terms, what does the technology Slack do? Oh, uh, I don't know nothing, but I think it's IPv6 has to do with that. But that's about it. All right. Yep, I agree. Yep, mm -hmm. acid with IPv6. I don't know anything else. I'm trying to remember if it it's 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 almost like DHCP for IPv6. Yes, very good. So when you see this acronym Slack, just think, hey, that's what that's what assigns IPv6 addresses. That's what hands out IPv6s. That's all it is. Oh. Okay. Uh, what does the acronym stand for? Anybody? Stateless address something something. Auto configuration. I think that's right. <laughs> I know a stateless address. I know it's that's uh, stateless. Stateless. Uh, stateless address auto configuration. Yes. Stateless. Right in the bottom. Stateless right address there. auto configuration. Fancy. But if you do see this on the exam, just say, "Hey, that's that's one. That's one automatically throw out IPv6s." Yeah. There you the E6 though. Hey, those of you guys that are studying for A plus right now, you, you noticing that you're recognizing some familiar terms already? Yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. All right, fam. Who's next? Has Ack went yet? Ack so cold. Yeah, I went. Stop trying to pick on me. Yeah, pick somebody. Kiwi. Back to Kiwi. Kiwi, you're popular today. <laughs> what are the port numbers for SMTP over TLS, POP over SSL, and IMAP over SSL? The secure port numbers. Oh, the secure ones for SMTP, I think, is 587 or 589. 587, very good. Um, POP over SSL is 995, 995. and IMAP is 993. Bam, very good. Anybody, everybody uh, got those port numbers already memorized, I hope? Hey. Yeah, he, came, he came right off the bat, too, didn't even have to think about it. I have a question. I've got I've got SMTP listed as 587 and SMTPS listed as 465. It, it is 465 and 587, but I, I think 587 is your 
your modern version. I'm not sure if anybody uses 465 anymore. Okay. Gotcha. But that is correct. Yeah, that would be SMTP secure as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm like 99% sure that 465 is, is deprecated. Old. Very good. All right, Kiwi, who's next? Um, has Ari or RC won recently? Can I go next? Oh, hasn't gone in the longest sure. time. Electro, oh, let's go. All right, Electro, you got this? <laughs> I can try. We'll, we'll do Electro and then get back to Ari. All right, describe three technologies or terms related to or associated with VoIP. Oh. If I recall correctly, a real time transfer protocol is used as a way for you to be able to streamline your capabilities of being able to maintain your voice and data communications in real time. And I think the next term is going to be an SIP, which is basically going to be used as a way for you to be able to describe the session initiation protocol whenever you want to establish a voice and data communication mechanism and stuff. And I think lastly, I think it's going to be, if I recall correctly, the H323, which is going to be an alternative to the SIP in regards to the world of VOIP. Very good. So uh, H H323 is a video codec, but it is related to, vo to VoIP, right? I think yeah. it's port 1729 or 1721 of the two. But so H when you see that H.323, that, that's basically like voice and video. That's a video codec part of, uh, of VoIP. And RTP, like you mentioned, that real-time transport protocol, that carries the body of a VoIP call, where SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, starts and ends it. All right, follow-up question. Port numbers for SIP and RTP. Oh, yeah, you want to know the port numbers now. Yes, sir. You want me to think about it really quick? Yeah. Oh, fam stole it from you. Oh. Uh. <laughs> so SIP is 5060, 5061. RTP is 5004, 5005. Very good. Solid. Oh, I see that. Nice answer. Um, so. Electro. Sorry. What's up? Electro. How long have you studied for this? Yes, and sometimes I forget easily. <laughs> oh no, I mean, you know your stuff. Right? We've time to test the yeah. intro. <laughs> yeah, that, that was good. So we, we put RTP and SIP out there. Uh, the video codec, H323. What other terms, anybody, what other terms are really close related or associated with VoIP? Jitter, quality of service. So quality of service is a huge one, right? QoS, traffic shaping. I agree. That's a form of quality of service. Jitter, or things like you know, measuring or metrics of bandwidth. What about 802.3? 802.3 AT and AF. That's a POE, right? Yeah. My triple E statement. Yeah, so power over Ethernet is also, especially in CompTIA questions. Power of Ethernet's associated with VoIP questions a lot. Because, like, you know, a VoIP phone, most of the time, will be power of Ethernet. Very good. Did we, uh, did everybody who wasn't familiar with all those get some solid notes or have any questions on that? No. Uh, FAM is asking about UDP and VOIP. Yeah, it, it definitely wouldn't be bad to associate VoIP with UDP. I agree with that. Because, I mean, a, a VoIP call is not going to send those those chunks of data to TCP, right? It'll just be flowing and you, you'll get them where you want. Very good. All right, Electro, who's next? I think it was me. Oh yeah, Ari, that's right. All right, Ari, here we go. What does AAA stand for? Authentication, authorization, and accounting. Very good. So the, the, don't confuse the AAA standards with the CIA triad. Now, follow-up question. In the accounting part of AAA, a lot of materials will throw auditing inside of accounting. So what is the specific difference between just generic accounting 
and the auditing portion of that. Give me a second. Sure. I'm um, like knowing who did what. Yeah. Uh, that's, I, I don't know. I've never been taught the difference. It's sort of just a guess. No, that's all right. That's good. So, uh, if you come across these terms like the accounting AAA bullet point versus auditing, the auditing term is specifying actually saving logs of user activities. Whereas accounting could be a, a lot of different things to monitor action. That auditing part is saving the actual logs of the, of the activities. Okay. You might get it in Net Plus. You will definitely get it in Security Plus. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I got a question on that. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. See, I know what I'm talking about sometimes. Everybody's taking notes. I, 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 can, I can feel it in the air. Ooh, all right. Who's getting question 20, Ari? Sorry, what was that? Who's getting the next question? Um, is there anyone who hasn't gone at least once yet? Nobody. Danny. <laughs> Danny, 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 Danny hasn't gone yet. <laughs> yeah, Danny's yeah. gone like three times by now. I don't, I don't think uh, The lone wolf? Uh, Eric? Yes, I've gone once. Yeah, I'll go. Okay. So Coach hasn't gone either. Whoever said I'll go, you, yeah, you go. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, Eric? All right, here yep. we go. All right, what does the term SCADA tell that's you type about a network? Uh, um, it's a type of industrial, and it can also be known as ICS, I believe. Yeah, so and realistically, if you see that term SCADA or SCADA, and you know that's like an industrial environment, and a lot of times it'll be an environment that has like a huge array of systems on a chip or simplistic systems that have like one function like I think in class we talked about like a water treatment plant right and there was like systems on a chip that had a single function like water temperature or water pressure lots of sensors yeah right right very good all right I thought that was gonna be a hard one but I guess you guys uh remembered that in class all right all right who's next Oh, I'm sorry. Um, how about RC? RC. You ready for your question, RC? Ooh. Is RC here? How about Coach? Coach. Coach is always here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Coach. What is the function of DNS and what is the function of DHCP? Oh. Uh, DNS translates uh, dom domain names into I IP addresses. Yep. Uh, D DHCP assigns the IP address. Very good. Automatically. Don't confuse those, right? DNS converts those fully qualified domain names to IP addresses, and DHCP automatically assigns IP addresses. Thank now, you. Those are MAC addresses to IP, right? <clears throat> What's that? It assigns the MAC addresses to IP, right? No, I think I think you're thinking of ARP. Ar ARP will assign MAC address and IP. DNS will take the fully qualified domain name like www.quizlet.com and convert that to an IP address. <coughs> All right, Coach. Follow-up question. Uh, never mind. I, th I think it's an actual question later. <laughs> Wait, um, I think it's a, I, think, I think it's a question. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Coach, you're up next. What is the difference between an SSID and a BSSID? I feel like I robbed you of an easy question. Uh, I don't know. Huh? Uh, SSID, that's... <laughs> well, you, you know what the SSID is. Yeah, th that's the, um... What's it called? Oh my god. 
<laughs> the ducks. Service set identifier, something like that? Yeah, so SSID is your service set identifier. But ultimately, that's just the name of the Wi Fi, right? The MAC address, right? Well, what, what, which one? The MAC address? No, it's like the, it, it, the BSID, this MAC address? Yes, yeah. So the basic service set identifier is the MAC address of your wireless access point or your router, if, if, if that's your access point. SSID is just the name of your wireless internet. Yeah. So it's super similar, but very, very different, right? Very good. This is my nightmare. <laughs> All right, who's up next, Coach? Uh, I could go. Uh, J Red. J Red. Yep. What's up? What's up? All right. Which Windows command should I use to see my DNS server and DHCP server IPv4 addresses? Uh, NS lookup. Final answer. IP config. Uh, Isn't it like... IP config? <laughs> Where do you get those? I can only see them in the <laughs> So, I'm glad you said NS lookup. Don't fall victim to that. So let's open a command prompt right quick. All right. So with IP config, you just get basic IP information, right? Nothing crazy. It's just hey, here's your here's your uh, IP before and your some that mask. But IP config all shows you everything, including I don't know why I'm using a tiny window here, including DHCP information, DNS server information, and your MAC address. And so uh, there, there is more than one opportunity that CompTIA might ask you about isolating this IP config all. Gotcha. Super important. Very good, though. All right, who's next? I'll nominate uh, Danny K3. Danny K3 again. Danny, what does the term north-south traffic tell you about where the data is flowing? Sorry, no English. <laughs> Casey, um, Casey, I don't know this one, essay. sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get this far yet. Oh, that's cool. So cool. give this to Swoop. Um, it's the traffic flowing in and out from land to land. There you go. Yeah, so it's really easy. Nice. North-south just means that traffic is leaving your network and coming back in. If you see east-west oh, cool. traffic, that means that traffic is moving laterally inside your network still. Okay. Pretty straightforward, right? Wait, so, so what's... Wait, can you say that again one more time? Sorry. Yeah, north north south traffic. This means traffic is leaving your network and coming back into your network. But oh, okay. East west means it's moving like from server to server inside your network. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Very good. Okay. Um. So Eric said mm. we're going up and down between layers of your own network and not externally still be considered north south. Um. In my experience. Anything not leaving the network is still east-west. Okay. Um, and may maybe my company just uses those terms wrong, but for us, north-south means it's leaving the network and coming back into the network. Gotcha. Very good. It's interesting that he says that because then you think of like privilege escalations, right? When you're escalating, that's like going north-south and that could still be in a network. So it's kind of weird how those thought processes kind of change depending on whether you're pen testing or dealing with security or if it's just basic networking. I don't know. Well, it's and, and like, brought it up. Without giving too much information, like the networks we work with are, are not simplistic at all. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about massive distributed switching networks with a lot of servers. So really determining what's closer to the ultimate, you know, gateway router and what's not would be kind of difficult without mm. knowing. Um, so maybe that's why we simplify it, but I'm pretty sure the exams want you to know that north south is leaving the traffic or leaving the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. 
All right, what do you guys think? One more question, then a quick five minute break. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sounds yeah. good. Let's right. go. I need I need my nap, and my Teddy Grams. Teddy Grams. What about the goldfish, yeah. man? All sure, right. Whatever my mom packs me. Uh, Danny, you're up uh. next. Who? Oh, never mind. <laughs> oh, I could I could go. Who wants to take this one? I'll take it. Yeah, take it. Yeah, okay, uh, three so layers of the three-tiered network architecture. Oh, yeah, this is not hard at all. No, it's, um... It, so in our, <laughs> in our Net Plus, we had that three-tiered network architecture and the spine and leaf pictures. Yeah, it's the, um, core layer, distribution aggregation layer, and access edge layer. There you go. So let's find a fancy picture. Actually, this is the one I stole specifically for class. So NetPlus does mention this traditional three-tier core, quote-unquote, aggregation and access layer versus the spine and leaf architecture, which I think that NetPlus is one of the, wants you to know that spine and leaf allows more lateral east-west traffic in the network. So make sure you're, you're familiar with these two basics um, before you hit the NetPlus. All right, break time. Break time. Break time. Let's go. All right, four forty-eight. I'll see you back here in four and a half minutes. Right All right. Yeah. When? How long the break? Um, four minutes and thirty seconds now. Okay. Okay. Anymore. I just want to die! Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me get the picture of me crying as a baby. Actually taken yesterday. I don't know if anybody wants to see that. I'm not gonna ask. I'm scared to ask. What the? <laughs> Coach, what did you put in the chat? I hear a lot uh, of chat. I'm not quite sure. Oh, nothing. I deleted it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it again. Yeah, can we stop the kicking, please? I didn't know that. Layer 2 tunneling protocol uses IPsec and UDP. Oh, man. That's me as a kid. Danny, how, how much time are you giving yourself for this? I think I'm going to enroll at WGU and let them pay for it. Oh, okay. So hopefully my mom sends my documents. How, and how I much can are get you trans them translated. 
how much are you transferring in? I'm transferring the A plus and the uh, Google Career Certificate we were talking about earlier. Yeah. So. Like I wasn't able to. Um, three classes. Okay. I, I had to do 10 classes before I even got to A+. Plus. One of them one of them was the ITIL Foundations, sir. I was like, I would have to get that one too, huh? Yeah. Wow, that's great. What? Um, we were talking about the IT support specialist one in Google Career Certificates. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. ITIL. Yeah. So. Well, you do? I did not know that. That's good to know. They also have the cybersecurity one, too, now. I hope this review is, uh, is helping us out a little bit. It's been pretty good. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, yeah, thank you. There's some stuff that I don't know, but it, like when yeah. I, like when I'm learning it, it, it it's gonna like trigger in my head, like oh yeah. Like when, you, this. Get, when you come across it, like oh we have yeah. this question, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's it. I hope you just have a, a list of bullet points you know you need to hit up after this. It's a only goal. All right. All right. Who's next? Um, who said that they're testing on Saturday or something? That's me. That's, that's me. Uh, Are you going to answer this one? Oh, we got two people testing on Saturday? Well, I'm testing tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, tomorrow. Can right. answer this one? But he can go, though. It doesn't matter. All right, Eric, you take this one. All right, what is the main indicator that a cloud service is a platform as a service service? service. Um, like something like... A database type of software would need a developer to um, configure it and enter in all the information. Yeah, and this is A plus or Net plus or Security plus. Right. But if a cloud service needs, if a company needs their own developers, that's going to be a platform as a service. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, who is next? Danny. I I just went. No, she didn't. Gavin's gone like four times. Yeah, now. we had a break before <laughs> that person just answered. So. All right, Swooping Bird, you're next. What is desktop as a service? Uh, another name for uh, um, like uh, RDP. BDI in the cloud. Virtual desktop interface. That's uh, not not synonymous with RDP. So desktop as a service. It, it, it's, Pick it. As a service, so it's, it's actually like. Oh. Whoops, I was muted. My bad. So, not the same thing as RDP, right? It's as a service. So, it's something offered by a cloud service provider. So, like desktop mm -hmm. as a service would be a company that would actually rent out that service of offering users virtualized desktops. So, I mean, if you have 20 users and you don't want to deal with the security of the actual workstations, you can get, like, desktop as a service and persistent where it would save overnight or non-persistent where when the user logs off, it completely reimages the desktop every night. Yeah, that's with, um, oh, with uh, those Dell Wise Thin clients, that's exactly what they do with those. Yep. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Nothing saved on that device. It's all at an off-site server, and it has just enough processing power to show the... Yeah, yep. So this this is a new as a service that was not in uh, A plus. So if you see D A S, desktop as a service. I thought that was Danny as a service. I got the most. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It is also. I offer services. Oh, well, Whoa, I just buddy. failed this house because of you. Thanks. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to go down there that rabbit hole at all. All right. That's a, <laughs> next question. They're, they're regular services. Okay. Nothing bad. Hey, hey, I, I'm, I'm just a spectator. Who's, who's like, next? I, it's actually like Thailand. It's like whatever you pay, you get. Oh, no. <sighs> Crazy shit. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I have to edit that up. I'm glad this is going on YouTube. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, Lone Wolf. Well, let's, let's get the next question going. What is the difference between an IPS and an IDS? Who's, who is that being asked? Say the letters. Say the letters, dude. If you don't know. Lone Wolf? I think he'd rather do it alone. Well, maybe, maybe he's gone. Uh, One man wolf back. Hey, hey coach, help him out. Uh, one detects, and the other, like, prevents it? Yeah, an IPS will detect and prevent. While an IDS just, just detects, right? Um, yep. Also remember that you can see H or N at the beginning of either one of these. So host-based or network-based. So NIDS or HIDS, either one. H is host, N is network. Uh, you may also see WIPS, Wireless Intrusion Prevention System. So keep that one on your radar, too. All right, Coach, who's next? Uh, is. Fizz, you're up again. Which OSI model will I find a switch or layer? Or sorry, a switch or bridge? He said two. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> layer two for switches and bridges. Uh, I have a few questions about bridges. And the, the classic definition of a bridge is literally just a device that will separate or... or Combine the local area networks internally, so it's still layer two. Not as common as let's say a switch in modern networks. All right, Fizz, who's up next? Fam, fam, you ready? Yeah. What is an EUI forty eight? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Phone a friend. Isn't it something like the way that IPv six converts like a, a MAC address, like a IPv six, like a MAC address to IPv six? My man. Yeah. So an EUI forty eight is just a fancy way of saying that 48-bit physical address, or MAC address, right? That, and that EUI standard is just a standardized naming convention dash number of bits. So you might see like EUI 64 to reference part of an IPv6 address. But I've seen some really easy questions that looked really mean because they didn't say MAC address, they said EUI 48. So it's sort of like RFC? Yeah, yep. So this is 48-bit. It's all MAC addresses are 48 bit, right? Yeah. Okay. That, those uh, six pairs of hex numbers? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Very good. Uh, who's up next? Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> Pick swooping. Swoop? Yeah, swoop. Oh, you got an ad. Good job. All right, what metric is used for distance vector oh. writing protocols and what's used for link state? Uh, hold on, I gotta read this. What metric is used for distance vector routing protocols? Mm -hmm. Um. Quack. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know, hops? So distance vector will use hops, right? Very good. What oh, wait, that was use? right? Yeah. Oh, wait, oh, it's a two-part question. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're 50% oh. there. Link state's gonna be up or down? Uh, what metric? There's a very specific word for the link state metric. <clears throat> Phone a friend? Uh... Yeah. Who's making that sounds? I have no idea. <laughs> I vote I vote for Coach. Let's see it, Coach. Coach, what's the metric for link state writing protocols? 
like OSPF. I'm not that far. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, what do you got? Eric Clifford. Um, it's it, it's um the cost, which can be yes. hops or the transmission speed. Yeah, cost, which basically that, that term cost just means performance, right? Right. Yeah, and it, it can use a lot of different variables there, but cost equal, you know, ultimately equals trade or uh, performance. So distance vector uses pure number of hops from source to destination. Wake state is the performance, also called cost. Very good. Very good. Uh, kind of important on that plus. All right, who's up next, Eric? Um, Kiwi. Kiwi. I'm here. All right, all right. Tell me one detail about Zigbee and Z-Wave. Um, I don't really know, to be honest. Like, we, I was supposed to learn this, but like, I just associate it with IoT, and from my understanding, it's like it's it's a it's a mesh network that doesn't actually also use Wi-Fi. So I'm believing like every device is using ad hoc and also connecting to Wi-Fi. Yeah, there you go. How you gonna say you don't know? Then give me a right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick in the same. Oh, because like every time, every time it's like on a practice question or something, I always get it wrong. Like I don't know what they are like individually. Like Z Wave was supposed to be a technology, but then none of my resources ever really went into like the specifics. So I just figured it was one of those things that we didn't really need to know about. No, but, but like I kind of know what it is, but like I can't explain it. Like infrared is infrared, but like Z Wave is still a mystery, I guess. So let's, I mean, you're 100% right. I mean, that, that was a really solid answer, dude. Like, Zigbee and Z-Wave are specific to, there are specific wireless technologies used by IoT devices to make mesh networks, right? And really, the only thing you need to know about these, like, in reality, Zigbee uses 2.4 gigahertz, which means it'll, it'll, it'll transmit farther than Z-Wave, but it can also interfere with 802.11 2.4 gigahertz. Whereas Z-Wave uses some kind of small, I don't remember, I don't remember the number, it's a small megahertz um, frequency. But 800 it's, megahertz. Okay. Yeah, so, something like that, yeah. But it's it's lower power, but Z-Wave devices won't interfere with Wi-Fi. But yeah. Now, I now, would, you, now would you put those in a screen subnet? Uh, if you want I them would. to be externally accessible, yes. Like to be a little, little more secure, safe. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, if you wanted them to be accessible from the public, then yeah. Yes. Like, uh, for example, there's uh, a lot of cities that are going uh, Zigbee for their street lights. So I saw an article about how um, these IoT street lights. If one street light goes out, this the the city engineers immediately know. Because the network of streetlights report back that one's out almost instantly. So kind of kind of cool. There's a lot of different uses for these. But ultimately, if you mentally connect these with IoT, you're probably going to get most of those questions right. Very good, man. Very good answer. Very okay. good. Kiwi, who's up next? I want to do another one. All right. Look at this motivator. Okay. Volunteer himself. <laughs> Danny, you should take lessons there. Yeah. Don't oh, worry. Once I, once I, I do the net plus, you're going to be like, Danny, shut up, please. Lone Wolf is back. Much. <laughs> Lone Wolf back? Just All wait. Right. Well, Ki Kiwi gets this one, and then, then Lone Wolf, you can get the next one, right? Oh, all right. What is an A record, quad A, MX text, and C name record? Yeah, Lone Wolf can do this one. He's back. Lone Wolf's back. All right, Lone Wolf. Wait, wait, I got it. Uh, so C name is your canonical name record. Uh, that's your. Uh, I'll come back to that one. Text for, uh, text record. Um, it's like notes that you can put in with your DNS records. Or I learned that you can actually like write machine code that can read. <clears throat> MX record, your mail record. The four uh, A or the quad A is your IPv6 record, and A I think is your IPv4 record. Correct. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, okay, go ahead. No, so that's absolutely right. You're, a, a basic A record is an IPv4. Yeah. Quad A, IPv6. 
MX is your mail records. Now a text record is literally just that, a plain text record. And a lot of times these are used, and uh, we, I use these multiple times a month uh, to manage our DNS records. But a lot of times like a vendor will say, hey, add this text record to your DNS platform to prove that you own the domain. So if you're using some kind of vendor that's working with your website directly, they can email you a text record and they just use that for verification. Like, all right, you, you, you want to add your website to our, you know, our service, add this text record that'll verify that you actually own and, and manage this website. So t text records, when I get emails about them, they're literally called validation records. I mean, and then a C name is an alias. It's a canonical name, but like think about Facebook.com. Well, FB.com is also the same website. Just ah, the same. Right. Definitely got to know these DNS record types. Any questions? Is the time to live in the text record? Like, um, if they're describing some type of service? Uh, you, you, well, for most DNS, or most DNS records, you assign a, a TTL, yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Basically, how long that that will actually go before it's automatically terminated, right? Right. And realistically, how long it's, it has to do with caching, how long it's cached before it has to go back and revalidate. Gotcha. Uh, and Security Plus, we'll get into a, a little bit more about the TTL and how that can lead to some resource exhaustion if it's uh, misconfigured. That'd be fun. All right. That was, uh, that was Lone Wolf. Yeah, who who's going before I went and that pass is on to me. They get the next one. Uh, <laughs> was that Kiwi? Kiwi? That was Kiwi, ah, yeah. Kiwi you're yeah, up. One. You're up, Kiwi. Okay. All right, so this is a super difficult, easy question. <laughs> if you were speaking to someone new to IT, how would you describe the function of a port? A port is a hole in a machine that you would plug a cable into so two different machines can talk to each other over the wire. Well, so not to be confused with an interface, so like a port as in port 25 is SMTP. <laughs> oh. Um... I would it describe it as like point a road. And then start. Yeah, that's a good one. A virtual point. A virtual point? Okay. Anybody want to add on to that? A hole? Um, okay. It's like it, the IP of the address and like to your house and the port will be like a room. Okay. Uh, I, feel like the port, <laughs> I feel like the port would be like uh, uh, only allowing, like calling the mail office and only allowing, allowing like someone to send a, a letter that has like a red stamp on it. Like spe specifying what mail you want delivered to your house. This, this is not an easy question, is it? Yeah, this is hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, it's really hard the trickiest one so far. L like a big tunnel? Like used to home? travel from one, one computer to another? Okay. I think it will be more like almost like an address for what component or what part of a program would need to get that specific information. So program based, so I like would, that? Yeah, program based and you would use it to specify exactly who is receiving, what would be receiving the data that you're sending. So and would it be... To help make sure. Would it be safe to say that a port is kind of like a software-based imaginary roadway dedicated for a specific type of traffic, hence a protocol? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like non-IT wouldn't get that, over. though. Like, it'd be pretty... <laughs> hey, Halo. <laughs> so, it, it's, 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 it's hard... Yeah, so I mean, I was just, and when I taught you know, A plus, especially hitting these port numbers for the first time, right? You know, uh, I always described it as just that within a program, like an application, 
think of 65,535 possible imaginary roadways. And each one of those roadways is assigned a specific type of traffic. So like port 25, that, that roadway is specific for outgoing mail, right? Sending or relaying mail. And then, then ultimately, I would use that to kind of evolve the conversation into, that's what we call a protocol, right? Protocols are basically just how data universally is accepted to move around the internet. Woo! Well, a lot of good, I like yeah, that, a right. way of organizing the data, a way of organizing how the data is sent and received, yep. Yeah. Like, like this sounds like it would actually be a question for like a entry level job too. And then like when you're put on the spot, it's like, oh crap. <laughs> uh, I used to ask, when I was hiring instructors, I used to ask this question specifically in interviews. Yeah. And you would not believe how many people with like master's degrees in computer science got trained with by this question. Um, yeah. I can see that happening. It, it, it's rough, yeah. This is not, it looks easy, but it's not an easy question. Mm -mm. Um, you don't have to remember 65, 535, um, but just know that there's a, over 65,000 points. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let, let's heal from that question. Next question, who's got it? Me. All right, here you go. What are the That's three non-overlapping channels of 2.4 gigahertz into to 11? Uh... No, nah, it's easy. That's one, six, and eleven. Yeah, they agree. With very that. good, very good. Hey, is anybody in my uh, security plus class currently? Yeah. Unfortunately, I am. Not. Unfortunately, dang. Yeah. Savage. You should join. I wish I was. That's what I mean. Oh, I think you may Unfortunately, you were in the class. <laughs> oh no! I said unfortunately not. You monster. <laughs> um, so. <Hey. laughs> Security Plus adds some acronyms, co-channel interference and adjacent channel interference, CCI and ACI. So like co-channel interference would mean that a bunch of devices are on the same channel, like all on channel six. Adjacent <laughs> channel interference would mean that, hey, something's on channel six or something's on channel five or four and they're close, but hitting each other. So a little bit of the extra Security Plus funness in there. Hey, Mark Legion 5 Pro, what's up, man? Hi. Hello. What's up? Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> and, and Mark, Mark, you ready for your next question? Hi. All right, hit me, hit me. All right, this one's you. What is, the, what is the main collective function of SPF, DKIM, and DMARC? The main DKIM and DMARC is to um, make, oh, ensure incoming emails to an account are valid and certified. Exactly. Or have a certification. Very Pretty much good. That's from the sender. So all three of these combined, in Security Plus we talk about them a little bit more in detail, but the sender policy framework, DKIM and DMARC, are really just there to tell you that the person sending the email actually has an authentic signature and they have the right to send the email based on that domain or website. So if you're looking at a platform um, like O365 o and it flags something, but the SPF, DKIM, and DMARC are all green and, and good to go, it's probably a valid email. If these are not valid, that's a good indication and that's a, uh, a spoofed email or something malicious. There we go. Good, good questions in the chat. All right, Mark, who's next? Are, are we calling on people? Yep. It takes, okay, the, it takes uh, the blame completely off me. I want to see either Coach or Axel Cold answer a question. All right, Axel Cold, you ready for your question? Yes. Coach. I'm as ready as I can be. 
All right, all right. <laughs> all right, A plus going into Net Plus this and Security one. Plus. A data center should be what percent humidity at all times? Is it a uh, sixty? Oh yeah. No. No. Mm. Isn't it? What? Well, what Professor Messer told me it was. Professor, right? <laughs> Be between 45 55? Yeah. I, saw, I saw between 40 and 60. 50? Oh, so, 50. so classically, like the range, you want it as close to 50%, right? Ideally 50%. Mm, but I've been lied to. As right. low humidity is dangerous. Remember, the lower the humidity, the higher the risk of ESD. 50. 60s corrosion risk. Well, Messer, Messer, Messer probably said 40 to 60 range, which is 50 percent. Not bad, right? Yeah, yeah. test okay. out 60, I think. Mm. Uh, so every resource I've the... ever had was 50 percent. So it's close to 50 or 40. So, to 60. so no 60. So it's anywhere between 40 and 50. I, I I've always had the notion that it was 50 percent. Okay. It's close to 50. All my resources are always 50%. But, I mean, it's not like you're going to have to choose between 50 and 58%. As long as you know right in the middle, as close as possible. Don't blame Messer. Hey. <laughs> I blame banned. Messer. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Like We're all getting banned. Banned, banned, banned. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're all banned. So whoever that Messer guy is. Aren't you also banned from Professor Messer's Discord? <laughs> I, I am. I oh, know. man, right? <laughs> I was trying actually... to be helpful. Apparently, too helpful. Yeah. He said, Dion, who? <laughs> <laughs> Coach, when a technician observes a rack diagram, she notices the rack is measured in U's. How tall is a standard U or rack unit? Are you measuring from the base? <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh, the tub. <laughs> none of that, none of that. Uh, you can't, you can't how is a standard me? No, I... Uh, I do I get a hint? Yeah, you gotta know this exactly for Net Plus. Well, and like when you buy a device to put in a rack, the device is literally labeled like 1U, 2U, 4U. Inch and three quarters? An inch and three quarters. Or, for those of you that don't use freedom units, 44.45 millimeters. I feel offended. The rest of the world. But 1.75. 1.75 <laughs> inches. 45. So you do Let have to Let me speak to, to your that. manager. My manager? Okay, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna lie, I cheated on that one. <laughs> oh, so, we know. <laughs> It's it should be should be free <laughs> points if you get those questions in the exam. One point seven five inches. One point seven five. Yep. All right. Who's up next, Coach? Danny. Danny. <laughs> Hi. Danny, what's the I'm difference between a cold Danny, site, now. warm site, and hot site? Yeah, don't get this wrong. <laughs> uh, so, cold site oh. will be cold, warm, warm. <laughs> oh, good one. I'm sorry, I don't know this one. Um, Bellette Swooping Bird. That's okay. He sounds hot like he knows. Site, a hot site has everything uh, already transferred over, ready to go. Um, a warm site is basically all of that minus the data, the up-to-date data. And a cold site is something that's not ready to go at all and would take uh, hours or even days to uh, get ready oh. for productivity. Very good. So a hot site has all the hardware and data. You just got to move the employees over, right? A warm site is defined as almost being a hot site, meaning a few hours away, maybe some data mm -hmm. transfer to become a hot site. A cold yeah. site is just a location. <clears throat> Takes a long time. Now, the test might also ask you about which one's most uh, cost effective. So cold site will be cheaper, right? Hot site will be more expensive. I had a question mm. like this, and the answer was cloud site. Mm. Can you flip the cards? It had a cloud cards? site, cold site, warm site, hot site, and that it was specifically the answer was a cloud. Daddy, chill. What was the question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might play I a role. 
<laughs> it's basically more which, which is the most uh, uh, for, uh, for cost. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cloud Site is not really a site, right? I, I've never seen any CompTIA questions I want you to choose Cloud Site. There might be an error on that quiz, I bet. Yeah, I've seen that term on a few quizzes as well. Well, I okay. think what they're getting at is uh, a cloud, like uh, having your data in the cloud is good for, um, you know, scalability and for reaching um, other regions. And it can be more cost effective than having a hot site because you have less, uh, you might have like a less chance of natural disaster adversely affecting your business. And it might be. You know, but I've, I've never once, seen... you, once you get up to a certain point, it might be l cost less for the business than having like a physical site. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that the benefits of a cloud solution, but I've never seen it referred to as a cloud site, especially if the CompTIA question is asking for like a specific redundant site. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've never seen it referred to as a cloud site. That would be I think they I think they use it as terminology on CISP. I know they do in uh, the CISM exam, and they also have like mobile sites, stuff like that, um, all, right. all sorts of stuff. Okay, uh, I would just steer clear away from that term cloud site and CompT exams anyway. Be careful. All right, who's up next? We got eleven questions left. Do I choose? My man! Who? Do I choose someone? Yeah, sounds or... good. I haven't oh, gone okay. in a while. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna choose you. <laughs> All right. Okay, go ahead. Alright, what is the main difference between mean time to failure and mean time between failure? Uh. I don't know. Maybe it has something I... to do with how long it's down. Oh. I, I I don't know. All right, Wait, all right. can I try this one? Yeah, good. So MTTF is something uh, for something that you can't fix. There you go. And MTBF is something that you can fix. So between you fix and it breaks again. Very good. Yay! So I got, me, one. <laughs> got one. Got one. So like. <laughs> They think of like a, a magnetic hard drive, right? A magnetic, a magnetic hard drive will have a mean time to failure because you cannot fix it if it's uh, if it's broken, broken or losing magnetism, right? So MTTF is usually for devices that are not meant to be repaired. Mean time between failure, like a server, means that this is applied to something that is intended to be repaired. Am I explaining that well? Enough? I think I sort of get it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any questions on that? Mm -mm. All right, I'm who's, glad who's I got next? one right, finally. Yeah, that was good, yeah. <laughs> Are you proud of me now? Thank you. <laughs> nope. Yes. All right, let's go down to uh, Viral. Viral Mind. Aww. Yeah. What does ransomware do in your own words? Oh, it's a bad day. <laughs> uh, so basically, if you get infected with ransomware, you'll slowly lose resources to your computer, eventually to a point where you get you, you might get a screen where a, a group is demanding a like to extort money out of you for you to get your, your files back. And, um, you know, you should never pay. Uh, and, and the other thing too, even if you give them money, there's a good chance you may not even get like a decryption key. And if you are able to, if you do get like a like a program to decrypt everything, from what I understand, there's a good chance that you'll still be missing data, as well as you can't, uh, you, you need to question the integrity of the data as well. Yeah, very good. I agree with all of that. So ransomware, once it gets on a system or a network, right? It'll start encrypting all the data you can get a hold of on a network. And then once it gets to start beyond a certain point, it'll lock everybody out of their systems and demand a ransom payment to decrypt it. But like you said, there's no guarantee that it's, they're going to give you the key to decrypt. 
and there's no guarantee that when they do, it's not going to have integrity issues, if they do. So I agree with all of that. Now, like, after something like that, would you have to notify the public of the breach? Depending on the network and what kind of uh, data you're holding. You know, if, you're okay. if you're holding uh, credit card information and or healthcare information, yeah, probably. Am I, would I be so kind as to chime in on that? Since I was going to say something, anyways, I don't want to sure. go too far. Um, so... Obviously, ransomware involves them, like, encrypting your data, um, so you can't access it. Um, yes. If you have your data encrypted prior to that, and they encrypt it, you technically do not have a breach, because they can't actually see your data, so you don't have to notify the public, because it has not jeopardized um, that part of the CIA triad. Um, and if you're at any half-decent business, you already have your stuff backed up. So the data that you had is still available to you. It's still confidential. And you don't have to worry about the integrity if you have backups. Uh, so, yeah. True, partly. But I don't think that a previous encryption will save the data all the time. That really would, is going to depend on what type of encryption it's a, I think it's a huge, it's a big gray area. What do you mean? It's an interesting point. It is a good point. So some encryption could perhaps prevent or stop the ransomware encryption from happening. But it, I think it would really... Oh, I don't, I don't think it's going to stop it from happening. I'm saying, like, if they layer it, then, like, okay. But if you had it encrypted, like, like something under AES, for example, beforehand, then it doesn't matter. They're not going to be able to actually see it. And yes, they're keeping you... From from getting to your primary data, but if you have backups, that's like, okay, who cares? Like, whatever, you're not going to get into it and yeah. you have backups. So. But backups are definitely key. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. You'd be shocked at how many companies don't have consistent backups. It's kind of terrifying. Huh. I know we I, do. <laughs> uh, I will choose uh, Me. Nixia. Huh. Nixia. Yeah. How's it going today? Good, good. I hope I get another easy one. It's alright. If it's not easy, we'll, we'll get them together, right? Alright. What is the difference between a rogue access point and an evil twin? Um, so, the evil twin pretends to be a... Uh, so, this is about Wi-Fi security, right? Uh-huh. Um, and evil twin is pretending to be... Um, like your hotspot in a coffee shop or something like that will uh, create a Wi-Fi address uh, <clears throat> with the name uh, close to the one so you could potentially uh, connect to that instead of the coffee shop props. Hey, I agree. That's an evil twin. What's a rogue access point? Uh, uh, maybe... That's all right. So a rogue access point is just an access point that's unauthorized. So it's just unauthorized. Okay. But evil twin means it's actually transmitting a malicious SSID. Okay. Very good. Very good. So Sorry, that was what, louder than I thought it'd be. <laughs> what type of um, attack is um, man in the middle then? On path. Okay. And leave a type of that, right? Yeah, it could be it could be used in an on path attack or man in the middle attack. Yeah, but that that man in the middle or on path attack now that that's kind of a vague description of any time an attacker is intercepting data between source and destination. So I mean, realistically, yeah, I mean, evil twin could be definitely used in, in an on path attack. <laughs> oh great, and the chat gets a uh, PC real quick, right? <laughs> and moving on. Hey, uh, good job, Mixia. Good job. Uh, who's uh, next? I'll choose J Rad because he's talking. J Rad's very talking chat. right now in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, guys? All right. Which Windows command should be used to confirm connectivity to a resource? We got uh, ping. Ping, right? Ping, ping. confirms connectivity. Um, be very careful. 
especially if you're, uh, you know, doing a simulation question, and the last part of that is confirm connectivity using command prompt. Make sure you put mm -hmm. a ping in there for your free points. Just like a little wink, wink, nod, nod sort of thing. It's it's a it's a ping yeah. Mm, it's thank a you. Penguin, yeah. yeah. Mm. Human mm. in the middle. All right, a hey, swooping bird. Uh, Wait, I thought I got to pick. Danny, stop sending me pictures of dogs peeing. That's <laughs> very specific. Oh, so, so Send me a picture of a Labrador pediddling all over a linoleum floor. It's not cute. It's, it's, a, it's a river of pee. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm, I'm glad this is going on YouTube. Thanks, Dan. And map is for <laughs> And map is what for is skinning and also has a uh, graphical user interface that's also uh, used to develop a topology of a network as well. Zen map. Very good. In map, right? In map is used yeah, yeah. for scanning and network. Yep. <sighs> Finding open <laughs> ports. Finding open mm -hmm. ports and and footprinting and network, right? Very good. Who's next? We are going to have a lab session at some point in time. Whenever I get the labs done, I, I meant to get more done this week, but I ran into. Uh, Writing a thirty-page rub book at work, so mm -hmm. labs aren't coming this weekend. Danny, you're up. Me again? What is the function of spanning tree protocol or rapid tree spanning tree protocol? Okay, I'll choose someone for you. Um, Eric. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's to prevent um, um, switch looping and storms. Yes, exactly. And prevents broadcast storms. prevents broadcast storms, right? So spanning tree protocol, when you have redundant switch links, it's going to prevent those switches from constantly broadcasting back and forth, thus eating all of your bandwidth, right? Right. You're 100% going to get this on NetPlus. It's a classic NetPlus question. Gotcha. Very good. All right. We have five questions left. Who's next? Danny. 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 Again, dude? <laughs> you said me in chat. You did. <laughs> oh no, I said. It. All right, Danny. What is the 82.1Q standard? <laughs> the oh. me wasn't for me to answer the question. I'll choose someone else oh. for you. Um, uh, me. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you. Let's go. Let's go. Um, is it the the virtual uh, local area networking? VLANs, right? You can all look. Yeah, VLANs. Oh, yeah. VLANs. I was about to say, you can always phone a friend. Yeah. So this is I, I was about to say that, but you know, wanted to. So wherever you see this 82.1Q, it's, it's called the trunking standard or VLAN trunking. And this is another one that's always going to be on your Net Plus in some way. So you need to mentally connect 82.1Q for the standard technology used to create VLANs. Very good. Very good. All right, Axel Code, who's up next? Are you coach? Coach? In your own words, what is an administrative distance? <laughs> I have never seen this in my life. <gasps> Me neither. Coach, you're, were, were you in my net plus? No, what? Oh. We just started. Uh, I'm on day just two. Fast score two. <laughs> Game over. Anybody? I want to. I want to know who's doing that and where so, I can get all those. I can Are there like the 255 would be like your least trusted? Yeah. Well, so an administrative <laughs> distance is a measurement of trust, right? So when you see AD or administrative distance, if, if if a resource or a protocol is assigned an AD, zero is a direct connect. It's most trusted. 255 is your least trusted. So classic, classic network plus question. Administrative distance. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the times you're going to see this connected to routing protocols, yes. Absolutely. All right. I think I had two <clears throat> question about this on my net plus. Oh, did you? Yeah, I had. Yep, yep. It's, a, it's an important one. This is another one that if you know it, it's free points. 
Alright, I choose Mark. Mark, mm. for question number 48. What is the cider mm. prefix notation for the following output? I think he's working, um, but I think uh, slash it, Go for yeah, it. Yeah, slash 23. This is a slash 23. I don't even understand. So with, with a subnet mask, right, remember each octet is 8 bits. <laughs> oh, that's right, so but it's one bits. less, so it's 23, not 24. Yeah, gotcha. exactly, yep. So um, I have yep. a flashcard set on Quizlet that goes through all the subnet masks and cider equivalents. Uh, if you when you also that. have to mention, like, this is like a, it's a, a class class A private IP address, but then you've had a certain amount of bits borrowed from, you know, the, like, uh, the network. Yeah, I mean, you could say, I mean, it was a class A before it became class list, right? Yeah. 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 And you're borrowing a lot of bits. Uh, side question, how many usable IP addresses do I have on that network? A lot. No. <laughs> uh. How many? Two. Two. Five hundred. I don't know. Five hundred. I think it's um. So no, I'm sorry. Two I'm sorry to about the seventh, that. isn't it? No. So a slash twenty-three is five hundred ten. I mean, wait. Two to the fifteenth. So slash twenty-three, five hundred and ten. Slash twenty-four is that two fifty-four. So definitely know how many usable hosts in the submitting section for each one of these as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, our first Net Plus video on YouTube covers all the subnetting, including usable hosts. So uh, you're definitely going to get a few of those on Net Plus. All right, who wants question number 49? Um, Jared. Is that J-Rad? Did I just, did I just mm -hmm. get told? Oh, okay. All right, J-Rad. In your own words, describe a captive portal. Is it considered secure? Um, can I put a friend on this one? Yeah. Ooh. I'd like I to know this one. one. Whoever said they know this one. That's a trick question. <laughs> I'd like to give you a call. It's a trick All right, question. Uh, <laughs> a trick question and highly subjective. Is no, it? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure a captive portal, portal is when you um are trying to gain access to a, I guess like a free public uh, wireless network, and they take you to um their own like web browser, not web browser, website that's part of the like router, where you can uh you know like put in your email or what ha or what have you, and then. Accept the terms and then you gain access to the. Yeah, it, I, I, I think we've all seen it. I, I've seen them set up so many different ways. That's why I said that. But um, yeah, you're right on the money. Well, I mean, it's so like, yeah. like logging, like cl click here to accept the terms, or like a hotel where they say put in your name and room number and you get on the Wi-Fi. So it's just a basic acceptance, and it, it's basically more there to protect the owner of the network from legal issues compared to protect you. So. When you see something like this captive portal, don't think that it's safe and secure because you clicked it accept. You click mm -hmm. accept or you put in basic information. So captive portals just alone are considered not a, a valid uh, security parameter. Some of them like uh, I know you can you can add on like authentication and stuff, like authentication mechanisms as part of them, mm -hmm. but it's that's not always the case. Yeah, especially like not McDonald's, Starbucks kind of stuff, right? Yeah, it's usually just click. But it's really good to protect against like uh, botnets and stuff that don't have the capabilities to necessarily interact with those the same as humans. But like if you have like a, um, what is it like where they have you, uh, a you know, pick, pick, yeah, the captures, right? Like that too. It's part of like your captive portal. Yep, I agree. Oh, the sad news, guys. Last question. Who wants it? I think, um... I'll do it. Danny K3. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Danny K3 had her mouth wide open for it. Yeah. <laughs> if it's easy, I'll do. Yeah, sure. If I know. 
All right, a company is looking at antivirus solutions for their workstations. One antivirus boasts impressive scores in defense using heuristic scanning. What does this oh, yeah. term heuristic tell us? Ari got this one. Go ahead, Ari. You got it. Me? Mm -hmm. uh, it's detections based on how the malware acts in the system. My man! Yes. So heuristic okay. means it's not using basic virus definitions or libraries, right? It, it's looking at the actual function and, and how the malware is acting and not just relying on that inoculation from, from libraries. Very good. Did we all uh, pick something up from this little review session, I hope? Yeah, yeah for good. sure, man. Yeah. It was a great yeah, review. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Everything. Uh, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. For Net Plus. Yeah. I'm taking <laughs> Net Plus tomorrow, actually, so. Uh, good luck. Good luck. Oh, yeah, well, good I'm luck. kidding. I'm not. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hey, hey, let us know how it goes. And uh, I want to try to uh, get this video uploaded after I go back and edit out all my burps that I didn't realize were being recorded by OBS. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be, on, it'll be online soon. <laughs> Sweet. I'm going to take...